What I'm going to do tonight is um, take it uh, from a slightly different slant, which is to try and give you an insight into how we in Bureau Hapo would use computer modelling in its biggest sense to try and uh, answer a lot of questions that, that we have within our, our designs for, for buildings and, and for infrastructure. <coughs> and, the, and the things I'm going to cover tonight would um, be having a little look back and think about what did, what did we do before we had computer modelling, how did, how did we do our design, and, and how did we know that that was going to work. Uh, and then you know, moving into uh, the, the our own view, of probably my own personal view, is to why we use computer modelling, what is it that brings to us that, that we make us take that decision to go ahead and actually, actually use a software package to, to model. And then what I want to do is take you through just a, a small selection of different projects with a view to, to using those projects and the output of the computer model to show you the, the, the broad range of different things that we can actually do with, with computer simulation. And then to take that into a summary. Now, now this building here before computer modeling, this is a, a Victorian age building. Um, <coughs> it's not intended to show an idea that we've got that we naturally ventilated by opening up the, the, the side of the building. But, but actually, but in those days, it was fairly common that you'd go in there be an opening at the cupola at the top of the building to let warm air out. There'd be a whole raft of, of grills built into the, the plaster work to allow the air to come in. And somewhere within the body of that building, there'll be lots of ducts built in and, and allowing air to come in, cool and ventilated space. Now, yes, the, the climate was fairly similar then, but, but how, how did we get away with building these things? Because, in actual fact, some of it was done from precedent, from, from buildings that they built before, but an awful lot of it was by trial and error. So, so they'd go in and, and they'd try something and see if it worked. Now, we, 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 people in those days would accept a different set of climatic conditions inside. Uh, they also were prepared to wear different levels of clothing, depending on what light was inside. They didn't have computers, and they didn't have so much lighting. I think one of the, the big things that perhaps made people think that they had to change from this was that society became more litigious, uh, and all of a sudden the clients wanted to know why they weren't getting exactly what they had. So we moved into this grey area, um, which was a, a kind of a, a, a past that we look back on and kind of sneer on now, but. But we moved into an area where we decided, well, the safe thing to do was to mechanically ventilate everything. If we just run ducts and fans all over the building, we can push air where we want it, we can make it come in in whatever condition we want it at. That's the safe thing to do, let's, let's just do that. And we had fans making all of this work, and we had uh, we spent a lot of money in, in manufacturing duct work to, to ventilate spaces. But that wasn't sustainable, and, and in terms of your energy costs rising to run these fans, people began to realise it had to be a different way to, to design a building, and we had to move on. Um, so, so the question came then, we have access to IES, we have access to other computer simulation models, why should we use them? Well, I think uh, Don touched on it earlier, but if we have ideas, we all have ideas, but we need to test them to see whether we think they're actually going to work in reality. And, and while we're doing those tests, in actual fact, what we start to see is we start to identify some problems. But it doesn't mean that you abandon the idea, you can then take the simulation to another level and you determine what is actually going to cure that problem and, and make the whole solution work. Although sometimes we abandon it and just move on. But, um, assessing energy consumption is becoming one of the biggest elements in it now, not only through regulations in terms of Section 6 and SBM, etc., but, but being able to determine exactly whether you comply with the energy regulations and prove to people. Um, establishing optimum control strategies. Some of the, the systems that we've, we work together now, for the simple systems, the control of them becomes quite complex and integrated control of different systems. We need to know what works best. Um, verifying compliance with regs have talked about. And to allow us to stretch the boundaries, some of the projects we're going to look at here are groundbreaking in terms of architecture in terms of the volumes of space, in terms of the shape of the space. How do we know that the solutions we're putting forward are going to work in these conditions? And, and it's becoming more and more the case now that what's guiding the design principles of what we design is actually the output from doing the computer modeling. It tells us which direction we should go in. When we start off with a whole panel of different options to begin with, <coughs> ensuring that the requirements can be met, I don't just mean regulations by that, I mean that the, 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 a gallery and a museum, for instance, have very specific requirements that are outside of regulations, but we have to make sure that we can achieve those. And uh, I suppose at, at one stage as well, we have to think about protecting our own reputation. We want to know that what we provide, people are going to be happy with and going to work. But I, I, I like 
like to sum that up by, by this particular um, reason that we're actually using computer modeling is answering questions. Those are questions that, that we'll come up with as engineers. A design team will approach us and ask us questions and, and say, how do you know that this is going to work? But a client will ask that question more often than not. So what, what I'm going to do is take you through some projects now and just take you through some, not all, but some of the output from those projects just to let you see the kind of things that the questions that we were asked and how we answered those questions. Um, now, in the, the questions that we were asked on the Glasgow Transport Museum, you can see here, now these are fairly <coughs> wide ranging, a lot of them related specifically to uh, a gallery where you get close control conditions. We had to know that we were going to be able to try and convince the client that this novel design, this novel building, the huge volume could actually work as it's an air conditioned space and do it sustainably with, with um, uh, some control over, over the energy consumption in that building. Now, this one here, the, the question that we're asking here is how do we combat downdraft and the glazing? Now, we, we know, for instance, when we have tall glazing, and on the south elevation of the Glasgow Transport, you see the glazing is over 30 metres high, on the north elevation it's over 20 metres high. We know that when we get that, <coughs> you start to get a momentum of cold air, and that momentum of cold air, actually, you see a bit of cold air, this is against the glass. So we've cut a, a slice across the building with the glass here, the outside wall here. And what we've done with that model is use that model to look at the interaction of warm air coming in to heat the space. And we put trench heaters, this is a trench heater here with a fan in it, along the bottom of the glass. And what we're trying to do in simulating here is to determine which solution actually works, which solution stops air cascading down in here and causing this, this light blue space, the occupying space, becoming cold or drafty. So we worked through a whole a set of iterations here. These are velocity vectors that you can pick off. And um, with a number of the, solu the solutions we looked at, the velocity vectors were picking up quite fast and coming down the glass and, and coming into the occupying space. So here is, we, we see an output of a, a temperature gradient. And that's in this occupied space. And you can see it's, it's a nice even temperature in there. You're just beginning to pick up at just about head height, the warm air coming in there and changing the colour a little bit. And, and this one was, was the one of the ones that we picked off, which was to look at this occupied space if we didn't have the trench heating actually combating the downdraft. And you see the purples and dark blues showing that we've got fairly cold conditions down in there. And, and it also enabled us to work out that the type of trench heating that would work against its tall glazing had to have a fan in it. So, so that was one question answered on behalf of, of the design team and the client. The next one that the client asked us was, we, we want to understand where we can put exhibits in this space. We've got a lot of glass at both ends. All of the artifacts have a maximum number of lux hours that they should be exposed to before they either move them or put something else in the place. Uh, so the client asked us, could we in some way tell them what the lux hours might be like? What's the intensity going to be? Which artifacts should be put in certain places? And we were able to do an analysis which allowed us to do a map for them. And this map gives lux, uh, uh, thousands of lux hours or mega, uh, uh, mega lux hours. And uh, they just that. This was a, a great bonus to the client to enable them to plan out where we want to put artifacts. Um, so just add to this slide. So, so what, what we did here was, um, the question was, is the relative humidity in such a large space going to be stable? Uh, what we did to, to determine that was to break up the volume, both uh, horizontally and, and vertically. And once we broke up the volume into different zones, uh, we looked at a, an occupancy load profile. This is the one that the client gave us. This was the worst case that 1,500 people come in in the morning and don't leave until, until night time. That happened the first day. Uh, and then there was a, a different profile looking at that. So what we're trying to do is, is determine what is the risk to the client in, 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 in having that, to that condition. So um, that, that was some of the, the modelling that we did in, in the Transport Museum. Moving on to another museum that's recently finished down in Ayrshire, it's the Robert Burns Museum. We have here a different set of criteria, a different set of questions that, that we've been asked to try and demonstrate and give an answer to. And in all of these cases, we've used computer modeling to, to try and show that this actually works. 
The one that's slightly unusual that I picked here, um, just to give you a feel for how sometimes you do a model and, and you decide it's proved that it doesn't work, is that we were asked, uh, we're using a displacement system, so what you see here is a raised floor. We see ventilation ductwork coming into the air into that floor, and this is the, the one with the floor here. And we have a lot of grills in that floor to allow the air to come up and cool the space and rise as it heats up. And the question was asked is, can we find a way to reduce the number of grills on, the, on this floor plate? And what we thought might be quite a good idea was if we could have a shadow gap around the skirting that would allow air to come in there as well as coming through the grills. But we, went, we, we had a, a feeling that this, this might not work terribly well, we might just get too much leakage through there. But there was a risk in going ahead to try it, and then and, and we couldn't go back then. So we modeled that again. This is the, the, the diagram of the air velocities coming through that shadow gap. And we were able to tell from that that in actual fact there was far too much air coming through the shadow gap and not enough going through the grill. So we wouldn't get this relatively even spread of temperature in the space of the cooler here and, and much warmer in the middle. So, yes, sometimes you do a model and it proves things don't work, but, but it's more important to do it then and find out later. Another building that we looked at here was uh, uh, another building that's just recently finished, which we've done, which was a, a biosciences laboratory. Now, the type of modeling that we've done on, on this and the questions that we've been asked and tried to, to answer with computer modeling are quite different. Yes, we've done in Section 6, which was had come into play by this time, looking at energy modeling for Section 6. But uh, there was an interesting and novel approach that we had to look at, which was, was based on safety. Um, and, and this new building is, is shown in the model here. Um, the existing building, which you see the roof of here, for those of you that know Cathedral Street and the University, this is a, this is a library building running along Cathedral Street, the Royal Infirmary up here. And this is the roof of the Robertson Wing. And that roof has got a number of um, discharges from fume covers coming up onto the roof here. And the question that we were asked was, when we are running this building, and we had the toy wing at that time as well, with covers, is it safe to build a building here? Are these people going to get uh, contaminated by what's coming out of here? Is the likelihood that once we build this building that the contaminants from here are going to go into the air intakes out of the, of the new building? Or are the, the exhausts from the new building likely to go in reverse and actually get into, into the existing building? What we're able to do there in building that model was to actually look at different wind directions, as you see from the plumes there. Um, we got a, a, a list of all the contaminants and the concentrations that the university were using. And we're able to look at that and determine by the time you reach the buildings and by the time you reach the surroundings, what was the concentration likely to be. And in actual fact, the, the primary thing that came out of this, apart from saying it was safe to build the building there, was there was one chemical that they used in this building which we said wasn't safe to use while we were building it. So over the life of the construction period they didn't use that chemical in the fume covers in that building. I, I, I'm moving out of the, the range of Scotland at the moment because I've got a couple of projects I want to tell you about where maybe we did a lot of good quality computer modeling to prove certain things. This is the Queen's University Library in, in Belfast. <coughs> it's a building that was a 25 square metre library. It was a low energy design um, with uh, natural ventilation and displacement in the deep plan areas. But what we had to accommodate was a quite a large computer data centre right in the middle of the building. And we decided to use the heat from the data centre to heat the library. Um, so there was quite a lot of modelling and simulation that we had to do to prove that that could work. So the questions that came up for us then were, um, how you can see there, how effective the natural ventilation would be in cooling the space, large volume, tall space all broken up. And looking at just the controls philosophies and how this interaction of heat from the computer centre could be used to heat the building. Uh, well, this is one of the projects that we took of. It's a very large footprint in the building because we couldn't go at all. We had a displacement system working in the middle and we wanted to understand how well that worked in conjunction with natural ventilation in the atrium and natural ventilation along the perimeter here. So although you see a slightly different temperature here, it's still within the boundaries of, of, of where we had hoped it would be. Um, and when we looked at that in terms of a vertical thing, we, we knew that the, the height would create a temperature gradient. We wanted to make sure it didn't go too high or too big a temperature gradient. And we wanted to understand what having floor plates in the middle would actually do to that. So what we're seeing here is, is it gave us the comfort that there wasn't a huge temperature gradient between the upper floor and the lower floor. But nonetheless, we introduced a little purging system for this top floor because the client 
had some concerns even though we've done the modelling. So if it does get very high, that, that we can purge the, the, the heat coming out of the top level. And, and, and another demonstration of how this can be useful to us is that the, for, for the engineers amongst us um, who are designing these systems, we know that once you get to a tall space with convective heating systems, there's some worry about how much of that you just swap straight up to high level. How much of a margin do you add on to your heat emitters to compensate for that? And, um, and, and everybody goes with, with a certain number, but the, the range of that markup could be quite high. What we're able to demonstrate with this model, the first pass at it, was that the margin we put on wasn't enough because we weren't getting the temperatures we wanted down to the bottom. So we added a bigger margin onto the heat emitters and remodeled this and, and got the right result that time. This is an output from looking at, uh, when we said we used the, the heat from the computer server room to heat the library, it's not, the library can't always use that heat, but the computer suite is always discharging it, it always wants to get rid of it. So what, what we did, we introduced a, a, a ground heat exchanger where we would store that heat in the ground when it couldn't be used directly in the library and then it was going to be pulled out and used later. But what we had to understand was how does the temperature of the ground react to having a lot of heat put into it? How did the temperature of the water going in and out of that vary? Does, do they, does the water temperature get too high for us to be able to use it? And, and we looked at different control strategies, four different control strategies and monitored this is the ground temperature, these are the flow and return temperatures. And that gave us comfort that um, this system could work. And the main thing that we wanted to get out of this as well was, was, was actually, are we spending the clients money wisely? Were we spending on things that as engineers got us really excited and techy, but they actually didn't really do a great deal of work? We were able to look at this and get the number of megawatt hours that each portion of those systems actually input into the functioning of that building. And we were able to pick out controls philosophy that actually gave us the one that used the least energy, and that's the way that we set it up. And we want to, we're trying to convince the clientele us to monitor that in, under a post occupancy evaluation. We also had to convince the planners and the residents in these houses here that building this taller building, much greater mass and, and, and area that it takes up, wouldn't uh, internally darken out their gardens and never be able to grow anything again. So, so we, we built a model just to look at how the shade from the existing setup affected the residences and how that then, over the course of a year, would affect those residences. And this was part of the planning submission to show to the planners that in actual fact the, the amount of shade wasn't that different from what it was at that particular point in time, hence we get through planning. This image here was just a, an, an answer to the question. On the, the library, we have reading areas here, we have reading areas here, we have book stacks in here. The question was, in trying to cut down the amount of solar beam coming in through the glass, are we just cut out all the daylight going into the reading areas? Because that's not exactly not what we didn't want to do. And what we're able to do by modeling different types of glass was to look at the intensity of light that we got in the reading areas and prove to yourself again that that was a successful solution for it. One final project I want you to look at, I'm taking you further afield now, but, but it's really because this project has a lot of aspects of what Don was talking about that computer modeling can bring to a design. It's a design where you look at the shape and form of these buildings. Um, there's no regular surfaces on that at all. Um, it's in the middle of the desert in Saudi Arabia. Um, and there's a number of things that our client was asking us that we had to be able to answer. This was, was I suppose, a kind of cut down list in a sense as to, to what it was to be. And I'll just take you through some of those things to, to let you see it. The first thing was to, to determine where do we put glass on the building? Where is the maximum solar intensity? Because we want to try and make the glass in that elevation smaller. But because it's all rounded and curved, it's a, a more dynamic exercise that's needed than just looking at a square box. So we, we did this exercise here to, to form that. Um, on, on those <coughs> elevations, we were looking at, I'll jump on that slide there, but we are looking at protecting that elevation by a tubular wraparound system. Uh, and that tubular wraparound system needed some modeling to tell us how that would work, what was the best configuration. And if I jump back a slide, um, what we came up with was a circular tubes wrapped around the building. In some instances where we want to let more daylight in, these tubes have been flattened and we've got a greater distance between them. And in other areas where the intensity is greater, then we make the, the, the gap between the small and the tubes are wider. Uh, another interesting thing that we had to take on board to modeling this was that the thought that the desert winds could cause this to become like a flute for most of the year. 
we just had this acoustic whistling all the time and we had to model that as well to make sure that that worked. So, so some quite complex <coughs> things coming together here. This was the, the detail of the inner surface and, and this um, cladding system going in the outside. Um, the other thing that's very important to people in the Middle East is that um, they don't want to feel that because it's, uh, it's solar intensity is high and it's very warm that they can never go outside. They want to be able to sit outside like you and I, they want to be able to sit out in the garden. And one of the things that we're doing is taking a sunken garden for them and trying to prove to them that we could get sufficient shade and sufficient cover in there that people could feel like they could go outside of the building. So you see a series of trees, uh, there's a canopy that we put over it, we get a certain amount of self shading off the building itself. And then we begin to look at intensities, we begin to look at shading, and, and that gave the client a lot of comfort that the space that his staff could go outside and, and, and be comfortable. The other thing that we, we had to look at here was tall buildings, have large downdrafts coming off of them with wind coming off of the desert. You have quite intense wind sometimes blowing sand in from the desert. And we, we had to look at the geometry of this building, see what these gaps did and what the height of the building did to actual wind conditions. And having found that they could sit in the shade in a nice garden, we didn't want them to be blown off of heat when we go out there. So, so this, this next part of it was to look at um, different conditions, different wind intensities based on what we would expect people to feel comfortable doing. And, and in looking at that then we, we can draw this map of the footprint of the, of the external area with the buildings as you see sitting in the middle there. And we were able to prove to the client that, that with the measures that we had in place to combat the wind, that uh, this would be a comfortable place for them to get outside. And I think that the final one that I, I wanted to put in, and it's not something we do in, in Scotland unless uh, you were at a beach perhaps, but the question was, how do we reduce some of the sand building up around this building? Now this, this was taking computer modeling even, even for us to, to, to the next level again, but, but, but what we were able to do was, if I, if I use this little diagram here, we have the buildings and, and the site right here, and what we wanted to do was create a perimeter that acted as a windbreak. And, and what we modelled here was that we put in uh, that wind control very often means using a, a barrier and then a taller barrier behind it. And that causes the wind to come up and kind of wash up and over the site. Um, but what we were aiming to do to prove here was that a lot of the sand would get caught here. Some of it would wash over the other uh, barrier that caught, get caught in here, which is an area that most people wouldn't go into. But the key thing then was to analyse what the effect of vegetation is in here because what happens is that the wind comes up and over and as it travels in towards the building again, it begins to build up momentum, starts to re entrain sand off of the ground and takes that into the sunken gardens that we spoke about, but then start to build up a lot of sand and it would be a maintenance nightmare for, for the users. So, so what we, we, we did a number of models of different types and depths of vegetation in and around the building and found that the, the mixture of it uh, a heavy depth of vegetation here and a lighter vegetation here where people are walking would actually give a very sensible cut, a dramatic cut down on the amount of sand that would come in and, and form around the building. So that's just to give you a, a, a bit of a, a sense that the computer modeling as Don says it's, it's, it's a wide ranging thing, it's, you can use it to answer most questions that people will answer, ask you and, and very often it, it, you're hopefully proving that it's actually giving the right answer. So in summary, I would say that, uh, and similar to Don, that you're removing trial and error, especially if there's not a lot of precedent for what you've done, and you need to have something to be able to give you satisfaction. It allows you to take very complex designs, complex solutions, and not say no, that they're too difficult to do, or let's take a risk and just see what happens. Um, it gives you much more confidence as a designer that, you, that you, you can, you've done it professionally, that you've looked at it in a way that you're going to be able to give confidence to everyone else. Um, we can make sure, uh, uh, and, and more and more important nowadays, is that the design is energy conscious. Uh, these software and computer modeling packages are now the primary way to prove that you get low energy in the building, and, and it's become very important. And, and also, as you saw in the, the Plasma Transport Museum, that the solutions are compliant. So that, that, that's me covered all of the things I wanted to discuss. And thank you so much.